Welcome to the meta number 38 after season 38. So this is after the end of season 38, before season 39, the beginning of the 3v3 season. A welcome back, probably. I don't know how many new listeners, viewers there might be here. Still haven't done a podcast thing yet, although I'm looking at it. I'm looking at a lot of things, so that's no promise of anything happening. Anyway, what's the show? So this is looking at the state of the competitive GAC meta. By competitive, I mean people who are in the top few hundreds of Kyber 1, or, depending on their GP and their roster size, of course, are aiming to get as high as they possibly can. So I say, it's important to say the top few hundred, whatever, of Kyber 1, because that's where I play. So I have a lot more experience there. And frankly, that is where a lot of the YouTubers play as well. And they're the ones that make a lot of the fights that I see because the only reason you really, well, there's many reasons. Um, I'm a professional <laughs> GAC player. No, no, that's, that's a joke. But I do watch an enormous amount of fights from various content creators because that's what I find for me is a great way to learn. Yeah, thousands of them every season. So welcome back. I'm going to try and do this as quickly as possible. Well, I'm trying not to be an hour long show. I'm thinking more like half an hour long, but I do like talking and there's a lot of interesting things happening. So we'll see how it works. So this is split up into four areas, 3v3, 5v5, chips, and sort of game state overall. A little bit at the end sort of wrapping it up and i always split it up based on the act of datacrons for those particular sets so i'll spend the most time this particular episode talking about 3v3 coming up a little bit of a review of 5v5 but not so much honestly um what happened in the past seasons is mostly interesting to me as a predictor or a way to analyze what could happen in the upcoming season Oh yeah, and we're going to be watching in the background. I realized as I was going looking at this video, this this is from Ginger Jesus. I think I may have shown some of his stuff already. Anyway, some of his stuff is really interesting because he he also shares he has a Discord call going on with a few other people, including Jamax, 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 whatever slash Solo who's another content creator. I think they're in the same guild or something, I'm not sure. Um, but he's also another very entertaining and uh, educational, smart uh, GAC player. And they're often on a call together when they're doing their GAC or when they're doing Ginger Jesus' GAC. So it's, it's quite, I don't know, it's nice to hear the thought process and sometimes just giving shit to each other, which is, which is fun too. Um, and that's usually live, like as they're playing. Oh yeah, they do swear a bit on the show. So let's go start talking about 3v3. Yeah, this is how I break it up. So this is actually, I find, a fascinating upcoming 3v3 season. I will read through what I said here, but even before I, I sort of read through it, I'm not really going to read through it verbatim because these are just notes to myself as I'm preparing for the show over the course of the season and then right before I record this, um, I just go through it again and, you know, make it a little neat to take out the misspelling, well, most, not all of the misspellings and stuff like that. Um, so, for me, the main reason why this coming season, 3v3, and 5v5 too, um, but I, 5v5, it's still, there's so much we, we don't know about it that it's hard to say, especially because I think we'll have probably Tarful and Saw Gerrera in the next 5v5 season, at least for the people who wail a bit on him and, or people who just take them, like, gear, take them to gear 11 or something, because the recent characters, Pal, maybe a bit less, but Seer, um, Zori, uh, probably even, yeah, Marin, all of them are, they boost their team to a whole different power level, even at gear level, which is amazing. We, we haven't had this type of 
like total power creep change or power tier change. Uh, since forever the Star Killer marquees were a little bit like that, but not so powerful. I mean, it's crazy what's happening power level wise in the in the game right now in JC and TW a bit. Um, anyway, the interesting part I think about this three v three season is that set seven and set eight data crown wise really interact quite a lot and set eight is turning out i think to be one of the most powerful data cron sets we've had in a while it has great stuff at level three for both light side and dark side the five percent stacking one mostly but also uh dot prof as i like to call it you get protection up when you inflict a, a damage over time and there's more and more teams now that do damage over times mostly dark side but um and then, yeah, don't underestimate IG-11 with his damage over time. That's going to be an interesting little dynamic, I think, in some matchups. But anyway, so you get a lot of low level, like broadly applicable across the entire you know, roster size and usable at all, all, all teams that have Relic 3 and higher, which is most of all of Kyber 1 and 2. Not all, but the majority. Um, then you have some really, really great level sixes for Separatist and Tuscans, which, I mean, they do have some very powerful teams now, especially in 3v3, but not hugely. I mean, it's only a few teams they boost, but unaligned force users are going to affect a lot of teams. Two GLs are unaligned force users, Ray, Ray and Kylo. Um, and so there's a lot of like interesting interaction there. Plus a bunch of just like standard characters that I think are going to affect a lot. Talking about interesting interactions, I don't even know if I mentioned this in my summary, but now that I'm seeing this video, um, SLKR versus Lord Vader, with Lord Vader in many cases having health steal because it shuts down the non-GL counters quite a bit more. Um, SLKR is just going to destroy Lord Vader, especially if he has Watt with him the 100% health and protection, like his hit after he, after SLKR comes out of ult, is just going to be enormous. 100% damage, ridiculous. Um, so Lord Vader in some ways is getting a bit of a boost because he gets stop proc back, but it, you're just going to be so easy to beat with SLKR. And you don't really need Watt either, like go into ult with SLKR and you have armor or something, something that gives you restored protection. Yeah, you'll, you'll destroy Lord Vader. Um, so, anyway, back to my notes. Yeah, I thought I was going to get this in half an hour. I'm not so sure how that's going to work out. It's already at eight minutes. My goodness. So, yep, lots of great um, abilities in set eight. And many of them actually like counteract set seven with increased crit chance increased damage, stacking damage, double damage, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, which is different compared to set 6 and set 7. They didn't interact so much. So, let's go down here. Tuscans, Gemini Christmas. Um, already, Chieftain, Warrior, and Boba were very, very hard to beat in 3s last season, and now with the Datacron set 8, oof, this is going to be terrible. Or are great depending on whether it's your team or not. Um, I think this is going to be the number one rage team in the 3v3 season. I already expect the videos. Um, Zori is going to be more and more useful, I guess. She works great with set seven, of course, the resistance stuff. Um, some set eight bonuses that are useful, you know, she can fit on a Ufu team or something, but. Really, I expect it to be a set seven, but so many more people have her now and can use data crowns with her. Um, and she's great. She has one of people have Omicrons. And the rrr, 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 rrr guy with Raider, gonna get a nice little boost depending on what data crown you have as well. But in general, Tuscans are only getting better. Rrr's team was not the most powerful in the last few seasons anyway. Sort of fell off. It's easier to beat with certain counters and stuff. But this is going to give it a bit of a boost that will definitely not make it easier to beat. Like the uh, docks for Tuscans now stopping healing. It's pretty sweet. Shaman puts out dots. I mean, it's a very interesting, you know, anti-bounty hunter synergy there, which is a popular counter at least. 
Um, Star Killer in threes. Wow, this is going to be good. If you have the Ushu level six and Mar Jade uh, level nine, what a great threes team. It's going to shut down many of the popular counters or the common counters. Yeah, that, that's going to be very, very strong. Seer, I guess, I don't know if I'm saying Seer's name. Seer, Seer? I haven't played the video game, to be honest. Um, but anyway, maybe I shouldn't have admitted that now in public, but I think most people don't know how Seer's team works. Like, as a care, as a leader, she's an amazing, amazing leader. I'm really considering applying the Omicron for this three season. But it's hard to see. I'd like to save some Omicrons for when Survivor Cal comes out. And maybe Tarf will also. Anyway, even without the Omicron, she's a great leader. I, I think people don't understand how her kit works. First of all, one of the best characters, especially with Cal, you sort of need, you don't need, but they're very helpful close together, to have together on the same team. And then threes doesn't lose a lot of like even more defensive, be strong relatively in threes compared to uh, fives. And five, she's great too. But very defensively strong. Slow, 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 slow. So everybody has some slow mods they don't really use other places. Pop them on her. She actually, every time an opponent takes a turn, her cooldowns decrease. So again, in fives, this is a little bit better. But still, in threes, make her super slow. It's a defensive challenge because most people keep fast teams for offense, to be honest. Um, and it's a great offensive team too. Go up against a turn meter team and you'll have your nuke available on turn one. I mean, she, she's really good. And she does have a huge nuke and extremely defensively strong. She sort of like Zori. I think she's sort of like Zori, but she needs to be a, she needs to be a lead really to shine. And she's just now available. Like if you buy her, so We'll see a little bit in 3v3, but I think this coming 5v5 season is where people will start to realize how good she is. Yeah, amazing. She's a great, great character. Great character. In a way, I'm surprised they didn't give her a Datacron, but because she's not really farmable, I can sort of understand it. Whereas, like, Cal has a very good Datacron, very good level 9, and Cal and Seer are going to go together the majority of the time, especially in threes. Yeah, I can't say enough good things about her character. And in threes, I think she's going to be just, she's not going to be quite as bad as the Tuscan Chieftain because many more people have Chieftain and Warrior than they have her. So, yeah. Uh, Newt, it's level nine is, eh, it's better than I think people expect, but not amazing. I think more, more important is the level six because it stops days. So against like the Jedi Knight Anakin, team that's going to be a lot better uh, and just in general it's going to be quite flexible I, I think this is especially in three is going to be pretty good you know the, the meme gl newt this will make him a little bit more of a gl pretty good uh trench yeah i don't know what i feel about trench honestly i think his data crown is primarily going to be good in fives just because there's so much stuff going on in this kit i mean Gonna be good in Territory Wars for sure. GAC 5's next season. And 3's, I think there's some really interesting things you can use in there. But there's like so many things that this kit does that he almost needs a full team to really make the most use out of the Datacron, in my opinion. I think he's gonna be really good and very surprising to some people, but I think he still has a few hard counters. Like, um, yeah, Treya though, oh my goodness. Treya is unquestionably the best offensive team, I think, in the entire meta for this 3v3 season. She shuts down all of the new counters. Um, although with Chieftain Dot preventing healing, it's going to sort of slow her down until they actually take turns. It's interesting. Um, anyway, in general, she is like an incredibly powerful offensive team. Very good on defense too, but I think there's so many things that she shuts down on offense that it'll be more common to see here offensively. We'll see. I also wouldn't be surprised to see, well, I saw this a few times last season, but now even more than ever. Um, weird, 
but I think we'll see it a few times. Treya, um, Talon, and Savage. That, that's going to be interesting. Or maybe even Savage, Treya, Talon. But I think Treya lead is a bit more beneficial. So much ramping in that in that setup, it's insane. Yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. Some interesting C potential as well there, but C is just too easy to beat with other GLs now. And threes too, especially. Yeah, just C solo versus C whatever. It's easy peasy. Sorry, it's easy. Uh, so seven and eight interactions I mentioned a little bit already. Um, they, they counter, I don't want to say they counter each other. Eight does a lot to counter season seven. And in a way, this makes me suspicious that set nine might have dodge in it since we have accuracy in set eight. Like it gives some logical basis for that sort of decision, putting aside the cost benefit side for CG. Um, but this is the first time two Datacron sets have really interacted a lot. So I do think it's an interesting sign that we may get dodge in set nine with like less powerful stats, you know, not dodge with health steal, offense, defense, dot prot abilities, etc. So we'll, we'll see what happens, but I wouldn't be surprised if we got dodge. Dodge with a, maybe a more light side, dodge and light side without the dark side thing to make teams like uh, Lord Vader extremely annoying. We'll see. I think dodge by itself is not too bad, honestly. It was just mostly bad in set four because it came with the Empire cooldown and damage over time thing. Like it was just three incredibly power things all together. So if you have only one of those, yeah, annoying, but I mean, could be a lot worse, in my opinion. Um, yeah, offensively too, I think you have a lot of power coming with set eight, with the level three. Whoa, what a huge amount of power for level three, both light side and dark side. Amazing, amazing, amazing. That's, that's fantastic. Mostly in fives, there's just so many more buffs going around, but in three is also good for many teams, uh, especially GL teams. In um, also the level six, again, like I mentioned earlier, mostly good for Ufu. Separatist and uh, yeah, mostly Ufu because I think Separatist and um, Tuscans will oftentimes want their like sort of faction specific level six, but some some good uh, great level threes. I think better than the twenty percent TM one to be honest. Um, and talking about twenty percent TM, don't forget to fix your mods. There's so many stupid uh, modding choices that were made over the past four months with like make this unit the weakest and stuff. Not stupid, I mean, they're were, they were pretty cool, some of them, but very annoying. And yeah, just a niche thing to do for four months. So fix fix away your mods, the weakest doesn't really matter. I mean, it still matters for some some things like, you know, Sopatano and stuff like that, but in general, not really a huge deal anymore. Uh, and GL interactions, wow, this is, yeah, th this is gonna be very, very, very interesting. With the amount of I mean, it, it, a lot of it has to do with JMK and no revive for Cap being gone. Um, you also have the fact that SLKR and Ray are unaligned force users. For Ray, it doesn't matter a huge amount because probably she's going to be with set seven using the resistance crons there. Or SLKR definitely makes a difference. He gives out a lot of buffs, so the set three is, is pretty good. Giving him stacking offense. Um, and because he's Ufu, and anytime he goes into alt, as long as you have Watt or Armor or some other options, um, mostly Watt or Armor, though, you can guarantee that he has 100% protection while he's in alt. And so usually that's three turns that he's going to kill anything on the board if his damage is doubled. Like crazy. Does, and because Watt is not really needed in Trench, or not as valuable in Trench in threes versus fives, I mean, it still interacts with Trench's level nine. All I'm saying is there's some interesting stuff going on. And, uh, 
um, the level sixes for Ufu, and especially with GLs. Because Java is suddenly way more valuable with no revive being gone, and Afro DC is gone, and Hondo DC is gone. Hondo will still be able to kill um, to kill Malgus, especially with the smuggler uh, smuggler bonuses from Set Seven for sure. Um, but it changes the whole GL interaction stuff a lot more than previous sets, I think, or maybe just Set Six did so much with no revive. Mondo and Afra, and 20%, but 20% mostly a five thing. Um, it'll be very interesting. I think we'll see a lot of fails on the GL level. Yeah, talking about GLs, like, man, Jabba is, is really good again. Really, really good. He also benefits from set six, set six smuggler stuff a bit. 2% TM is, uh, set seven, sorry. The 2% TM is quite, quite good. But again, mostly fives. I mean, um, 5v5, yeah, I'm not going to say a lot about 5v5 right now. It is, it's too early to tell. Most of the testing hasn't been done. By, by testing, uh, I mean TW, of course, you know. That's why you have TWs to test for the next 5v5 season. No, but that's not, that's not true. Nobody read my notes either. Um... But there'll be a lot of arena testing once people get the data from and so you're able to try them out and stuff. Right now, most of the data from testing has been done by people who get lucky rolls or whales who are spending on the conquest store. Oof, that is going to be at the top, top end or the way for whales or krakens, maybe you could call them, who spent a lot of money on getting, I don't want to say unlimited, but sort of unlimited uh, con or data from materials because of CG's screw up with the datacron store um yikes especially i think in tw for the spendy people in guilds it's going to be one heck of a seed Ugh. yeah some crazy data prompts the next four months i think because of this issue set eight is going to have a lot of people with a lot of data prompts but the one nice thing at least i think about set uh, excuse me, the next 5v5 season with set 8 is because most of the datacrons that you want to get are the same you'll be using in 3v3. Like, uh, of course, we have another conquest sort of around the, right before the next sort of 5, 5v5 season starts, so you can refine your datacrons a bit, farm a few more. But it's mostly going to be re rolling for level 3, the 5% offense or dot proc stuff, um, and stats by and large and of course i mean some characters are going to be really good and people want those but you get those as you roll for the other ones i think it's my opinion um, because there's not as many like unit there's no hondo there's no afra i think tuscan chieftain will probably be or not chieftain it'll be warrior they'll want for the tuscan team it'll be great in fives poggle is pretty good especially if you have this micron for tw but it's pretty niche you know um, uh, Relic 7 Poggle, pretty much strictly for the higher end guilds who maybe, you know, you can justify it by needing him in, in Rise of the Empire or something like that. We'll see. Um, but all that to say that there's not a lot of 5v5 specific stuff to worry about now, data front wise. And even team wise, there just hasn't been a lot of testing. so. Not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Ships, there's no change from last month. I'll just leave it there. You want to read my text? You can pause the video for a minute if you'd like to. Read some more stuff. Ooh, exciting. More reading. Yay. What an acronym for a skill. Um, okay, let's move on to game state. Uh, interesting. I think I've talked about this through the last few months. Um, I think I put all my... <laughs> ah, I put in some of my notes here and I didn't take them out. Bam, see you later. 
So let's go to actually the real notes for this. Um, it's it's going to be a very interesting, a very interesting month. I feel so. Ship layouts are fantastic. I think this week we'll probably get like Tarful and Sagarera. They might announce some stuff about the new raid, like what their reward is going to be. I mean, putting aside their regular gear and stuff like that. It's going to be uh, set seven or seven star mod materials. It's going to be a new relic tier. Is it going to be a new character? I have, I really have no idea, but probably we'll get a bit of idea um, of what's coming, coming up. Um, because usually a week or two before major new content release drops, we start seeing some stuff in the game files. Um, could be art assets or pack details or something like that. So we have an idea of what's going on, but I am looking forward quite a bit to the rate changes just from a time saving perspective or time management perspective. I don't have to be on at a certain time to do raids. I can, you know, do them at night or in the morning when I have some time, um, which is great. Um, fleet, I think we'll actually see some more interesting fleet meta or some changes to the fleet meta, just because people will be more willing to try stuff. A little bit, you know, a few percentage points different. I'm curious to analyze this next uh, next month or after it's been about a month of a particular GAC season with fleet layout layouts available. Because there hasn't really been any fleet meta changes besides layouts. I'm assuming this would be that case in a month until the new Sith fleet arrives. Unless somehow the, the new units they're introducing for the fleet impact the existing meta. They might a little bit with the Empire setups we have going now, but I really don't think it's going to be much. Um, yeah, like I said, the new raid system, finding out what the rewards are going to be will be very interesting. Besides that, how is the meta going? Actually, I really enjoyed it. I think this is the best the best meta we've had since Datacrons introduced. And I said that I think last last season too. Um, all of the non-GL counters are fantastic. We are again, it's like the third month now of an entirely new power tier of characters. All the new marquee characters that are coming, the way they've been doing Datacrons, um, GLs are I don't want to say less and less important. Like GLs are easy. You don't have to think a lot about GLs. You know what GL is going to be, especially on offense. Like everything in general is shifting towards offense. It's very hard to have a very good, strong defensive team. It's great. It's easy to get defensive holds like the first week of GAC when data isn't available for a specific a specific mode and data crown combination. Um, but in general, I cannot think of a single team last 5v5 season or the 3v3 season before that didn't have a hard counter. You just had to know what it was. And some of them only had one counter. Most had two to five. Um, but with these new units, so, they're so, so good on offense. Like you can beat a ton of other top tier teams that you couldn't before. Um, or you can beat many more top tier teams than other existing teams. Like Bad Batch is a fantastic team. It's like four or five teams. But if you take Tuscans or Seer or something like that, you can beat 10 teams that were of the previous year or so of power level. I don't know if my explanation is clear, but the, the main thing is the new units and teams they're introducing or the new units and teams that they lead, oftentimes making new teams out of old units, which is, is so cool. I mean, it's to encourage spending, but it's like, it's a cool concept that you don't have to cannibalize existing teams to make a new team. Um, they're very powerful and extremely powerful on offense. Some also good on defense, but yeah, uh, it's a really cool meta. I love that. You can be creative. You get a lot of benefits. If you think of things that are outside the box a little bit, you don't need them at relic levels in many cases to be very useful. It's all, it's great. I, I love it. It's very, very fun to, to play and to watch. Um, yeah, time management. This is continues to be the, the greatest downside, in my opinion. Conquest just takes too much time. Hopefully, raid system will save a bit of time for raids. 
I don't really think it's necessarily going to save time as in reallocate when you can spend the time, which frankly is just great. It's just as good for raids that are not a huge time commitment, 15 minutes or something like that, you know, but having to do it at a certain time each day, just the same way that arena payouts used to be. Yeah, that's, that's no good. Um, yeah, if they improve conquest, that would be amazing. This conquest is sort of easy because they have some really, if you get lucky with this combos, but there's, if you get the ones that get dots automatically and ability blot on ability block on dots, you can just like hit auto with a lot of teams and you'll win. But it's still annoying out of auto and waste of time. So wrapping it up, I'm not changing anything about what I said last month. I think they'll have to come out with a new competitive game mode. Have to. I think they will. Maybe not until you know they introduce a new fleet or something like that. A new Sith fleet around that time, perhaps. But I think they need a new competitive game mode. GAC is good. They need and territory wars. I think for some people they really enjoy it. Some people don't. Just not interactive is my main concern. Like I love the fighting part about it, but I don't have time to spend being part of the strategy side. Um, I had it in the past, you know, I did that quite a couple of years in the past when TW first came out and that was, that was enjoyable, but I enjoy GAC a lot more than TW and I can do what I want in GAC. I don't have to, um, like I have more decision-making in TW. There's no real decision-making you just follow the orders which is, I like that, again, I, I really enjoy the combat part of this game more than anything else, so I, I like the TW fights, but it's just not, there's not much to do. You know, go kill some team with your team, and uh, maybe you could... I, I at least enjoy the combat part, and I am pretty good at it. Like, I rarely make mistakes. Of course, I... <laughs> some mistakes I make are really stupid. Taking the wrong unit, the wrong data crown, whatever. Um, some are really bad, but in general, the fighting part, I don't find that, uh, it's fun, but for an entire game mode that you do, you know, four times a month, it's not so great. They really need some other sort of competitive, either re change up TW entirely, which would be, I think would be great. Um, or introduce a new game mode, which I think is more likely than changing TW. Who knows? I would love to have some other competitive game mode to play. Um, besides that, that's about it. I am really curious to see what happens. I hope they do some stuff with Conquest, the Conquest Pass. In particular, they did do one little change, which was put a lot of rewards at the beginning for the past owners, which is Nice. There's only positive things to be said about that, I think. I hope they do more with that. Like, auto wing would be amazing after you get red crate. Um, yeah, anyway, I'm pretty excited for this season of 3v3. Lots of interesting teams. I think the data crowns are really cool. Will make for more fun across a wider variety of teams than I think last season. But we'll see how it goes. I hope you guys all have fun good luck planning preparing um yeah enjoy gac thanks for listening watching however much you did if you made it to the end cool here's talk to you next time